Thank you, and thank you very much for having me give this honor, having me, and having this honor of giving this lecture. I uh, give too many lectures, and the thing I hate the most about giving a lecture is coming up with the title that describes what I want to say, and people get very impatient with me, and what they do when I don't present a title is they make up a title for me, and that's kind of what happened tonight. <laughs> and that process has brought a new practice to my speaking, which is I take this as a challenge to understand how I can address the topic I care to talk about in light of this title. Um, sometimes it's easier, sometimes it's harder. I spoke at Common Cause and they had this title. I was puzzled because from where I come from, we don't talk about the Lessig perspective, we talk about the truth, but uh, down there, they were interested in the difference between the truth and the lesser perspective, so I had a challenge before me. But here, I took the challenge seriously of understanding how my argument, the issue that I think is central, fits within this frame. And the first clue was to recognize that the talk tonight was not to be about the internet and a just and sustainable society. Its emphasis was an economy. And its recognition is we live in an economy that is neither just nor sustainable. We live in an economy dominated by industries like this, which because of a failure of regulation, get to externalize the costs of their production. They get resources for free because they don't pay for the carbon they spew into our environment. We live in an economy with industries like the healthcare industry, which gets customers for free as we force people to buy insurance but don't have competitive insurance markets, as we subsidize the price of pharmaceutical drugs by keeping patents around forever, decisions which radically increase the cost of healthcare while not increasing its effectiveness. We live in an economy with industries such as those represented by Wall Street, which because they are able to gamble with some of the riskiest financial innovations we've seen with the backdrop of a guarantee that the government will always step in because despite their claim that there's no such thing as too big to fail, these banks are too big to fail, they externalize, as Judge Posner put it, the risk of failure back to us back to the nation, externalize the risk producing an unjust and unsustainable financial system. This economy, neither just nor sustainable, invites us to think about how a new kind of economy, an internet economy, might make something here better. And my view is to answer that question, we have to start by focusing on why this one is so unjust and so unsustainable. Or if there's a why, people think there are whys, but I think the focus should first be on a root. Why? What leads to this flaw? And in answering that question, I'm inspired by writings like by Thoreau, who in 1846 at Walden wrote this, for every thousand hacking at the branches of evil, there is one striking at the root. So let's take this image and call that one a root striker and ask the question, looking at this economy, what would the root striker see? So here's the argument. First, she would see a problem. But to introduce that problem, I want to tell a story. And to tell a story, we need a beginning, something like this. So once upon a time, there was a place called Lesterland. Now, um, you, didn't, you weren't told that my first name is Lester. It's a secret. I try to not tell anybody. But my first name is Lester, so I'm allowed to make fun of Lester's. So I want to make fun of Lester's in the context of explaining what I think is at the core of this problem, Lesterland. Here's a picture of Lesterland. Looks a lot like the United States. 
Like the United States, it has about 300 million people, and of the 300 million people, as in the United States, 144,000 of them are named Lester. The internet told me that, so it must be true. 144,000, meaning 0.05% of Lesterland is named Lester. Now, here's the thing about Lesterland. In Lesterland, Lesters have an important power. There are two elections in Lesterland. There's a general election, and there is a Lester election. And in the Lester election, the Lesters get to vote. And in the general election, the citizens get to vote. If you're over 18, if you have an ID, you get to vote. But here's the catch. To run in the general election in Lesterland, you must do extremely well in the Lester election. You don't necessarily have to win, but you must do extremely well. So this is the picture of democracy in Lesterland. What can we say about Lesterland? Well, we can say, number one, as the Supreme Court said in Citizens United, the people in Lesterland have the ultimate influence over elected officials, because after all, there is a general election. But only after the Lesters have had their way with the candidates who want to run in the general election. And number two, obviously, this dependence upon the Lesters produces a subtle, understated, we might say camouflaged bending to keep these Lesters happy. And number three, reform that angers these Lesters, we might observe is uh, highly unlikely. <clears throat> okay, so that's the picture of democracy in Lesterland. I want you to see three things that flow from this conception of democracy. Number one, the United States is Lesterland. The United States is Lesterland. The United States also looks like this, also has two elections. One election is called the general election. The other election we should call the money election. In the general election, the citizens get to vote if you're over 18, in some states if you have an ID. In the money election, it's the funders of the campaigns, the relevant funders of the campaigns who get to vote. And as in Lesterland, in order to run in the general election, you must do extremely well in the Lester election, the money election. Don't necessarily have to win in this money Lester election, but you must do extremely well. And here's the key. There are just as few relevant funders in this democracy as there are Lesters in Lesterland. And you say, really? 0.05%? But here are the numbers. In this election cycle, 0.3%, one third of 1% of Americans gave more than $200 in any federal election. 0.055 gave the maximum amount to any candidate. 0.01 gave $10,000 or more in this election cycle. 0.0003% gave $100,000 or more in this election cycle. And my favorite statistic, 0.000042%, for those of you doing the numbers, you know that's 132 Americans, gave 60% of the super PAC money that was spent in this last election cycle. So I'm a lawyer. I look at that range of 0 0.3, 0 0.055, 0 0.01. Feels fair to me to say the relevant funders are around 0.05% of the American public, seems fair to me to say these funders are our Lesters. Now, as we can say about Lester land, this is what we can say about USA land. Number one, the Supreme Court's absolutely right. The people have the ultimate influence over the elected officials, the ultimate influence, because there's a general election, but only after the funders have had their way with the candidates who wish to run and win in that general election. And number two, obviously, this dependence upon the funders produces a subtle, understated, we could say camouflaged bending to keep the funders happy. Members of Congress spend between 30 and 70 percent of their time raising money to get back to Congress or to get their party back into power. And as they do this, they develop, as any of us would, a sixth sense a constant awareness about how what they do might affect their ability to raise money. They become, in the words of the X-Files, shape shifters. As they constantly adjust their views in light of what they know will help them to raise money, not on issues one to 10, 
but on issues 11 to 1,000. Leslie Byrne, a Democrat from Virginia, describes that when she went to Congress, she was told by a colleague, quote, always lean to the green. And to clarify, she went on, he was not an environmentalist. <laughs> And then point number three, reform that angers the funders in this democracy, we could say, is highly unlikely. So that's my first claim. The United States is Lesterland. Here's the second claim. The United States is worse than Lesterland. Worse than Lesterland. Because in Lesterland, you can imagine if we Lesters got a letter from the government that says, you get to pick the candidates who will run in the general election. You know, Lesters come from every income group. There are African-American Lesters. There are white American. There are not many women Lesters, but okay, let's put that aside for a second. We get these letters. We might think we need to act in the public interest. It's at least conceivable we would develop a kind of arist aristocracy of the Lesters. It's our job to help Lesterland. It's at least possible that our decisions would be motivated by this conception of our role to help Lesterland. But in our land, in this land, in USA land, the Lesters act for the Lesters. The shifting coalitions of interest that comprise the 0.05%, comprise the 0.05% in order to exercise their influence over the legislation that is being considered in that election cycle. So if it's climate change legislation, you can be perfectly confident it will be oil companies and coal companies that represent a significant portion of the Lesters. If it's healthcare reform, you know it's pharmaceutical companies and insurance companies and doctors that comprise the funders, the Lesters. If it's Wall Street regulation, it's Wall Street that comprises the Lesters. In 2010, the largest sector contributing to congressional campaigns was Wall Street. Now these Lesters, comprise this 0.05%, adding their influence not to force the government to act in the public interest, but to get the government to act in its own, their own interest. And in this sense, the United States is worse than Lesterland. And my final claim, whatever one wants to say about Lesterland, against the background of its history, its tradition, in our land, in our Lesterland, in this USA land, this conflicting dependence we should call it corruption. Now, by corruption, I don't mean kind of brown paper bag corruption where cash is secreted around to members of Congress. I don't mean a kind of Rob Lagojevich conception of corruption. I don't mean any criminal act. I'm perfectly willing to stipulate that nothing I'm talking about violates any law. The corruption I'm talking about is perfectly legal, but it's a corruption because relative to the framers' baseline, it changes the dynamic of how this government was intended to function. Our framers gave us what they called a republic. But by a republic, they meant a representative democracy. And by a representative democracy, as Federalist 52 puts it, they meant a government with a branch that would be, quote, dependent upon the people alone. So here's the model of government. They have the people. They have the government. I do my own slides. It's cool the way that bounces like that, right? So people and the government. An exclusive dependency, and so would the public good be found through this exclusive dependency. But the problem is Congress has evolved a different dependence. No longer a dependence upon the people alone. Instead, a dependence upon the funders as well. This is a dependence, too. But it's a different and conflicting dependence with the dependence upon the people alone, so long as the funders are not the people. This is a corruption. And this corruption has an effect. Its first effect is to lead Americans to believe, and I think Americans are right to believe, but it's a separate point. Let's just focus on what Americans believe, that money buys results in Congress, quote unquote. 75%, according to a book, a poll that we conducted for the book I published last fall. A little bit higher Democrats than Republicans, but I guarantee you before the Republicans took control of the House in 2010, it was just as many Republicans as Democrats. So whether it's two-thirds or three-fourths, here it is, the thing we all believe, money buys results in Congress. Leading to point number two, that belief erodes trust in the institution of Congress. ABC and New York Times last year reported the confidence in Congress was 9%, 9%. You know, we should put that in context. 
It's certainly the case at the time of the American Revolution, a higher proportion of Americans had confidence in the British crown than have confidence in our Congress today. And that leads to point three. This erosion erodes participation. Rock the vote, uh, which organizes and turns out young voters and in 2008 turned out the largest number of young voters in the history of voting, found in 2010 a significant number of their voters were not going to vote, so they asked them why. Number one reason given by far, two to one of the second highest reason was, quote, no matter who wins, corporate interest will still have too much power and to prevent real change. And it's not just kids. The vast majority who could have voted in 2010 did not vote in part at least because of this belief. And even in this election, 40% of the people who could have voted did not vote in part, at least I suggest, because of this belief. And finally, point four, let's go back to this claim that the Americans are right to believe money buys results in Congress. Because I believe Americans are right to believe money buys results in Congress if we focus on the right sense of results. Because what are the results that these Lester's want? The Lester's from the energy industry or from the healthcare industry or from Wall Street. What are the results that they want from the government? And the answer is nothing, not a thing. What they want is to stop reform, stop progress, reform and progress that might point us to a just and sustainable economy because such reform simply doesn't pay. It is much more profitable to be able to run an industry where you don't have to pay for a significant input into your cost of production, where you can get that for free, that's what kids think when they pirate music. We can get this good for free. That's what coal companies think when they spew carbon into the atmosphere. We can get this resource for free. It doesn't pay to reform that unsustainable economy. The same thing in the context of healthcare. It doesn't pay to reform a system of healthcare to get lower cost insurance or lower cost drugs. It doesn't pay to end the gamble backed up by the American economy for these instruments that Wall Street has insurance for that we pay for because of the nature of their size and our economy. It doesn't pay and it's trivially easy for them to block these reforms. And it's here we need to point to the instability that has emerged inside of our government. In a world where the tiniest slice of the 1% fund our elections, where the tiniest slice are the relevant funders inside this system, it is trivially easy for a small number of people to unite to block the reform that might move us towards the end that we should seek, which is a sustainable and just economy. Trivially easy because of this corruption. And it's that corruption, I suggest, that creates this unjust and unsustainable economy. Okay, now that suggests a certain solution. If that's the problem, the systemic problem, that the funders are not the people, then the systemic solution here is to find a way to make it so the funders are the people to give them a way, you know, that sounds like give Congress away, and nobody would take Congress, so I don't mean give Congress away. What I mean is give Congress one way to fund without Faust, without selling their souls and thereby alienating most of America. And the one way, I increasingly think the only way to do this is to openly and loudly affirm the need for what I wanna call citizen-funded elections, systems where candidates can fund their campaigns with small dollar contributions, only, where they can opt into a system of taking small contributions only, and the system amplifies those contributions so they can afford to run winning campaigns, never taking money in large denominations. Now, there are many versions of this. There are matching grant systems, which Arizona and Maine and Connecticut have. Connecticut, when it adopted its system, in the first year, 78% of the elected representatives opted into the system of taking small contributions only, and 78% coming from Republicans and Democrats 
alike. New York City also has a system matching grants for small contributions to campaigns. Or you could have tax credits the way Oregon does, or you could have vouchers, which Bruce Ackerman and Ian Ayers proposed, and which I talk about in my book, where we imagine giving every single voter a $50 democracy voucher, which he or she can give to any candidate who says, I will take only vouchers plus contributions of up to $100. This is the Grant and Franklin Project, $50 grant voucher, $100 contribution for Franklin. Or just this week, the Americans' Anti-Corruption Act was introduced as a proposal for radically changing a wide range of problems inside the corruption of this democracy, but at the core was a $100 voucher idea to give people $100 components to contribute to candidates to fund elections. Or you could get all three of them together. John Sarbanes, a Democrat from Maryland, has something he's introduced into Congress called the Grassroots Democracy Act, which has matching grants, which has tax credits, and which has a pilot program for vouchers. But the point is each of these systems operates in the same way. It funds campaigns from the bottom up, and each of them then is therefore trying to reduce the gap between the funders and the people. So that rather than having a system as we do right now, where the top 1% per capita have 10 times the influence that the bottom 99% in America have through the contributions they make to campaigns, we can move towards the ideal that governs us in the context of voting where everyone's vote is to be the same not necessarily need to be the same for speech, but aiming towards a world where influence comes from everyone in our society, not just the tiniest fraction of the 1%. This is what citizen-funded campaigns are. Only citizens funding campaigns, but all citizens funding campaigns. And if we had a system like this, where candidates took small dollar contributions only, then we all could believe, as we all want to believe, that when Congress does something stupid, it's either because there are too many Democrats or too many Republicans, but not because of the money, because we would have removed that cynical assumption from the equation in our ability to understand their behavior. And if we did this, it would make it enormously harder for industries like these to continue to perpetuate the system that exists right now that makes it possible for them to sustain this unsustainable, unjust economy and easier for Americans to believe that money is not buying results in Congress. Okay, that's the solution, but here's the reason the solution may be impossible. Kind of depressing, I know, but here it is, the reason it may be impossible. This is Jim Cooper, a Democrat from Virginia, who served in Congress as long as all but about 20 other members of Congress. And when I interviewed him for my book, Cooper said, you see, the thing you gotta understand is that Capitol Hill has become a kind of farm league for K Street. K Street, where the lobbyists work. So what he meant was members and staffers and bureaucrats on Capitol Hill have an increasingly common business model, a business model focused on their life after government their life as lobbyists. So between 1998 and 2004, 50% of the Senate left to become lobbyists, 42% of the House, those numbers have only gone up. And in April, United Republic calculated that the average salary increase for the people they tracked going from being lobbyists, from being congressmen to lobbyists, was 1,452%. So this is a system where everybody inside this beltway depends upon the system surviving, begging the obvious question, how is it possible that we could attack this cancer that is Washington, D.C., effectively <laughs> from inside the beltway? Because cancer doesn't cure itself. And it won't be cured here with dinky little reforms suggested from inside the Beltway. Instead, what will cure it is a movement unlike any we've seen since the Civil Rights Movement or the Progressive Movement, taking on a corruption as large as any we've seen since George III. Okay, so here's the opportunity for that movement. The Chattarati in America say that the interesting division in American politics is between the left side 
and the right side. I think the interesting division in American politics is between the inside and the outside. The inside, the people inside of the Beltway, and the outside, the people in the rest of the United States. And to borrow and remix the title from this book, we can say the inside, DC, is from Mars, and the outside, we, are from Earth. Now, when you think about the distinction, when you recognize the difference between what they focus on and what we think about, I think you can recognize a certain kind of politics that goes with each inside and outside. And following Nigel Cameron, I want you to focus on the outsider politics, what Nigel calls the exopolitics that is beginning to emerge inside of our political economy. The exopolitics is not a politics of politicians. We're not talking about wannabe congressmen or wannabe senators who are kind of working their way up into the system. We're talking about citizens, a citizen politics, citizens demanding that their politics change. But here's the link to the subject of this talk. Using the internet to make their politics change, to produce what they see as a just and sustainable economy. Now, there are many examples of this, and I think they are increasingly frequent. Waves of what's described by the participants as, quote, open source energy, producing a new kind of political force inside of the system. Now, I think the beginning of this was in 1998, when MoveOn was born. Now, you might remember, for those of you alive in 1998, but some of us remember, 1998, uh, there was an event in Washington. It was a procedure to impeach a man for lying about having sex with an employee. And two Berkeley programmers one day looked up from their screens and said, what the hell? Congress is going to impeach somebody for lying about having sex? There are a lot of problems in the United States. This is nowhere near the top. So what they said was, Congress should censure that man for lying for what he did, but then move on to address the issues which were important to the nation. And within a couple weeks, they had started a list that had millions of people from the left and right who were demanding exactly that reform and quickly changed the calculus inside of Washington about whether and how to proceed with that insane procedure. 19, 2009, I think the birth of the grassroots part of the Tea Party movie, not the insider Republican Beltway Tea Party movement, but the Tea Party movement that emerged from the grassroots, um, is another example of this exo political movement, using this network as they describe this open source network to facilitate the linking and amplification of the views and attitudes that they had identified in response to what President Obama was pushing. I think in 2011, the Occupy movement was another exo-political movement that found its voice through the echoes initially in social media that made it impossible for people to ignore what was happening and then finally the mainstream media turned around and paid attention to a movement that took over for four or five months the attention of America and redefined the core problem. It's not a problem about debt, not a problem about deficit, but a problem about equality inside of this nation. I think the movement that stopped the latest of the insane regulations pushed by Hollywood to end what they call internet piracy is an example of this exopolitical movement. When a bill which Chris Dodd, you remember Chris Dodd, he was a senator from Connecticut. When he was a senator from Connecticut, he said he would never become a lobbyist when he left the United States Senate. Just about two weeks after he left the United States Senate, he became the head of the Motion Picture Association of America. Not technically a lobbyist, but still head of the Motion Picture Association of America. And he delivered to that association the promise that he would get this SOPA bill passed, the Stop Online Piracy Act passed. He was confident he could do that because he had 60 senators in the United States Senate written confirmation from each of them that they would support this bill. But within a couple weeks of the internet organizing an extraordinary pushback to this legislation, including Wikipedia shutting down for one day, the pressure on Capitol Hill was so great that all of this support evaporated and the bill was withdrawn and stopped. The first time Hollywood had been stopped 
in its push for increased regulation, certainly the first time by the internet. And since that time, we've seen an increasing and more frequent wave of these examples of organizations using the infrastructure here to create a kind of political force that 10 years ago was almost impossible to imagine having any effect. Now, this is a kind of power. It comes from the ground up. It's new. Many in the movement think of it as GNU. But if there's hope, if there's hope, I think the hope is here in this exo-political movement. But the weakness in this movement, in this exo-political movement, is that it is extremely polarized. Like everything, like everyone in our society, the politicians, the political parties, the media, even the organizations trying to reform our society, making it better, they practice this business model of polarization. A business model that says you profit more the more you teach your members to hate the other side. The more you teach hate, the stronger your base becomes. We've become, in this sense, a kind of Ray-Ban culture, polarized yet very, very cool. Okay, now, <laughs> if this change, this change, this attack on this cancer is to be successful, my view is it must be something other than polarized. It must be a cross-partisan movement, by which I don't mean a kind of bipartisan movement where we kumbaya-like believe we all agree on the same things. We don't. What I mean is a movement that finds a way to cut across partisan lines because we cannot win the type of changes that are needed here if we remain polarized, if we remain divided. And what that means is that we have to find a way to evade that polarization. Okay, so let's take a time out here to see where we have been, right? So I said the first question we had to address was why we had this unjust and unsustainable economy. And I pointed to a root cause that I said was this corruption. And then I said it's conceptually easy to see how we could remedy that corruption, yet practically and possibly difficult to imagine us affecting the change, bringing about the power to remedy that corruption. But if we will, if we can, it's this institution, the internet, exercising its power through this exo-political power that could bring about this change, that could bring about this reform. But this movement, I said, is polarized. So the question is, how could we unpolarize it? How could we unpolarize the exo-politicians to make it possible for them to exercise their energy, their power in a way that could address the corruption. Okay, that's the end of the timeout. Back to work. Okay, so here's one way. It has to begin with this recognition, the recognition of Thoreau, the recognition of the root striker. It has to begin with a recognition that sees that if you step back from the issues that people care about and connect the dots, whether it's health care reform for people on the left or government bailouts for people on the right, whether it's global warming for people on the left or a complex tax system for people on the right, whether it's financial reform for people on the left or financial reform for people on the right, what the root striker sees is that we get no sensible change in any of these spheres until we change this corruption. So she then sees the need for three things to work together. Number one, the development of an alliance that focuses on common ground, and most importantly, speaks so others can hear. Okay, so an alliance. By which I mean a diverse yet cross-partisan movement. So think of this alliance, not this alliance, right? Different people, different people, who don't give up their identity by working together, that don't pretend like they all agree, but work together to a common end, or for us, an alliance between people like this and people like that. Then number two, this alliance is focused on common ground, not a common end. I don't think we have a common end between the far right and the medium and even uh, moderate left. But what we do have is a common enemy, a common enemy, and the only frame 
that could unite these two groups, in my view, is this frame organized around corruption. The frame that points to this picture of how our government doesn't function and gets people on both sides to see the way in which that defeats their objectives. And then number three, most important in my view, a movement that learns to speak so that others can hear. Now the more I think about this problem, the more I experience trying to convince people of its importance, the more it feels like the story of the beginning of the most important stage of the civil rights movement in the late 1950s, early 1960s. And if you think about that movement at that time, the fundamental question they had was, how do we get people to show up? How do we get people to come out into the streets and demand the end to the injustice that had African Americans had suffered for hundreds of years? How do we get them to use their power to bring about change? And the answer to that question was divided between two very different schools. One, roughly affiliated with Malcolm X, said the way we do that is we get them extremely angry. We tell them, this injustice has got to end. We will do whatever we can to take it back. We will fight as hard as we can, even if it includes violence. But in response to that position, which was plausible and sensible and made obvious clear, obviously unclear how it could get people to be mobilized. In response to that, King said, well, you know, 14% of the American public is not going to change this problem. And instead of focusing on getting a minority visible and angry, in particular angry in a way that will force others to ignore them, he pushed for policies that aimed to speak so that the other side could hear what he said. That practiced this reform in a way that the other side couldn't ignore. So rather than meeting violence with violence, which was the obvious response and would leave people to shut their eyes and shut their ears, he wanted violence to be met with nonviolence, which would make it impossible for the North to ignore what he was saying and let enough of them to hear it and split off to support the most important reform movement in 100 years. Now here too, I think we need this discipline. We need this discipline in this movement because it's easy to be on the side that rallies in our self-righteousness and speaks in a way that affirms what we know is true but makes it impossible for the other side to hear us, that instantly identifies us as a faction in the society rather than speaking in a way that speaks for the whole society. It's a discipline to speak so that others can hear the argument we make. And if we could do this, if we could cut across this partisan lines, if we could engage this exo-political movement to participate in that way of understanding, then this might be enough. So then, what is the role in this story for the internet? What is the role the internet is playing? I spent many years working around issues about the internet, many years being amazed and fascinated at its potential, but I don't think the internet is playing any role that's new here. What the internet is doing is nothing more than what Thomas Hobbes imagined happens every so often in any nation as the sleeping giant of the sovereign wakes up a sovereign comprised of the people and takes back control of the government long enough to shake it into a shape that could want to once again deliver the justice the people demand. Let me just end with one more point. I confess, a lot of people are not happy about this, but I confess Al Gore remains a certain hero for me. Um, here's Al Gore at a TED talk. I'm a big advocate of changing the light bulbs and buying hybrids and 
Tipper and I have put 33 solar panels on our house and dug the geothermal wells and done all of that uh, other stuff. But uh, as important as it is to change the light bulbs, it's more important to change the laws. And when we change our behavior in our, in our daily lives, we sometimes leave out the citizenship part and the democracy part. In order to be optimistic about this, we have to become incredibly active as citizens in our democracy. In order to solve the climate crisis, we have to solve the democracy crisis. The democracy crisis. So I dug up that footage for a talk that I had to give last week in, Mass in, uh, in Manchester. It was a climate change and money in politics talk. And there was a group of climate scientists. And I spoke, and then two other climate scientists spoke. Or two climate, sci climate scientists spoke. I don't claim to be a climate scientist. <clears throat> and then an activist, an incredibly important group, 350.org, spoke. And I have to confess, it was the most depressing event I have ever attended. Because like many people, climate issues came into focus for me around the time Al Gore made them incredibly prominent. At that time, I spent a significant amount of time trying to understand and coming to a belief about them, thought I had it pretty clear. Turns out Al Gore was an apologist. He was an optimist. Things are incredibly, incredibly much worse than anything he said. People are now talking not about how we address the climate crisis, it's how do we adjust to the inevitable consequences of this climate change? Where are the walls we're gonna build around Manhattan? Those are the questions they're talking about. How do we deal with the world where asphalt doesn't stick anymore? What will we do? They've moved on to assume the climate crisis is not addressed and now we just have to learn to accommodate to this change. And I sat there in the room and I thought, I thought first about three young children I have. And I thought, we are screwing this up. Not just here, not just with climate. With every single major issue any of us care about that drives the future our children will have, we've screwed this up. The democracy crisis. The inability for our democracy to deal with the most important issues, not esoteric questions like copyright or network neutrality or the internet issues, even the most important issues. We've screwed it up. But I don't think it's as much a democracy crisis as I'd say it's the republic crisis. It's the crisis of living in Lesterland. When Ben Franklin was carried from the Constitutional Convention in 1787, he was stopped on the street by a woman who said, Mr. Franklin, what have you wrought? Franklin said, a republic, madam. If you can keep it, keep it, a republic, a representative democracy, a government dependent upon the people alone. We haven't kept that to republic. We've lost that republic. And what we have to do, all of us, is to act to get it back. And how? Of course the internet is at the center of that. But it's not the most important part. The most important part is the discipline to speak in a way, the charity of a movement that speaks in this way, the charity and the discipline that we, that us, that this movement needs to embrace now. Thank you very much. So we will take a few questions from the audience now. Um, just so you know, it will be, this is a, a televised recorded event. It's gonna be on the website and webcast. So um, just for sort of copyright reasons, you should know kind of your hand makes you exempt as the lawyer will tell you. Um, so where should we start? Um, in, in the back, black coat, please.
And also, if you could keep your questions short and make them questions rather than uh, dissertations. There was a book by a Hungarian writer called A Book of Memories, and it described the socialist post-war uh, experience. It brings to life how important the imagination is in whatever one uses. And the only reason that I believe in reservation regarding the use of the internet and carefulness is because all imaginations are not alike. And we have to have moral development before we can have a universal access. You have a beautiful vision. I don't believe in enmity. I believe in the Chinese vision, actually, and the courage of men and women who've used the internet in the uprisings, respectively in China and in Egypt. But I don't think that the United States is wise to continue to pontificate if it has political action committees and if it is inconsistent and does not keep up its own moral premise in the normal relations. Others will use the internet accordingly. So I share the observation. I'm not sure I focused, I focused on the question. Um, the question is how can we uh, f use and, s and represent or sponsor the Internet Society in terms of enlarging the ideals rather than gaming or escapism? And how can we, in this country, be more just and um, stop the political action committees that were at one time, not too long ago, illegal? Well, the second part of the question is pretty easy to address. Um, the way the Supreme Court has decided the meaning of our First Amendment, the only way to restrict the political action committees that have emerged since Citizens United is to change that decision, which is either an amendment to the Constitution or a different Supreme Court. But I think the issue is much more fundamental than that. I don't think Citizens United destroyed the democracy. On the day before Citizens United was decided, our democracy was already broken. The Supreme Court may have shot the body, but the body was already cold. So I don't think solving that problem gets us to the place that we can begin to address this more fundamental question. Now, I think there are a bunch of overlapping objectives here. You know, one can aspire to a change, use the internet to change the way we as Americans experience and, and demonstrate uh, ideals and morality, and, and I'm, certainly, I'm certainly sympathetic to that. But I have, a, I have a narrower objective here. How do we mobilize enough to, cre to erase what I think is a false division in our society around this issue, and thereby make manifest the strong enough effort, uh, energy that it's gonna take to be able to overcome the enormous power that's in the center in trying to stop this, this type of reform. Sorry, we're, we're going to have to have one more question uh, All given right, time. Excuse me. Government issue, I believe, though, of the equipment would be a step towards making a more equal citizenry. I'd agree with that. That's a great point. Um, so one last question, just given time. We're going to try to have 15 minutes at the end or so for discussion, and then we're going to let Bob speak next. Um, all the way in the back. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. is this uh, uh, Oh, sorry, I didn't even realize you were... Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll do two questions. We'll, we'll take both of you then. So I, I was picking, not... not uh, but that's okay. You could go first, then. If you could keep your question short, and then we'll have you next. Uh, I was wondering, um, how many of you know Walmart, Scott? Uh, 1.3 million people in the United States, and it's got 2.2 million uh, in the world. Uh, now, how is this, th th Friday, there's going to be a demonstration, a real big demonstration <clears throat> of all the Walmarts in the world, uh, all in the United States. Um, it's going to be for, for Black Friday. They're going to take the stores and, you know, they're not going to sell. How can the Internet uh, be helpful in pushing this very, very big, important movement to associate. Well, I think the internet will play the obvious role in that. It will amplify the event. It will give people access to information about the event. That's not the sort of thing that news media would typically carry. So it will make it much more effective, much more powerful. Um, um, and I think it's an example of 
you know, the sort of justice that people on the left should be pushing for strongly. It's not the sort of example of an event that's going to unite people on both sides. So I think what we need to do is to figure out how we can walk and chew gum and tweet at the same time, right? We have to be able to do things that affirm our own values and don't deny the values we have, but also speak in a way that allows us to connect with people whose values we don't share. And that's the hardest thing in this business, I think, in this dynamic. Sorry, there's only one more question. It's the person in the back who, who was waiting. Thank you, and then we'll have Bob. Thank you. Um, quick question. If we, if we look at the title, um, I think almost the subtext of the, of the title is actually not that you know, the internet in a just and sustainable economy, but almost the, the subtext, which I think is probably wide of the, wide of the mark with, with many people, is that the internet in itself is a just or is enough to be a just and sustainable economy. Um, but there isn't an economy around the internet as such. So even though the internet actually is suffice for media purposes, is suffice for social media purposes, in itself, the economics are not enough to really provide the conditions for a new economy. Um, and you'll see that in the, in the failure of um, politicians who basically want to actually make more money when they leave office because presumably they're not paid enough while they're in office to, to want to continue. Um, and you see that with teachers, you see that with doctors. You, you basically see the sort of uh, co-opting a lot of, of, of the professions and of public service uh, by the fact that the economics of those professions and those institutions aren't really there. Um, what we therefore have is, is, is really almost a, a transition where the internet, you'll see this with Silicon Valley, which is kind of the world that I, uh, that I operate in, is that the, you know, the expectation is that those sorts of tech companies will provide a new economy, but then you see you know, the largest IPO with a failure of that sort of, failure at that level of that sort of company, there's a failure generally. So is there, do you have an idea as to what are the conditions for a just and sustainable economy if the internet isn't it? So. I think it's first to, important to recognize that the internet has taught us the ambiguity in the word economy. So we typically think of economy, we did before the internet, to think about the sort of commercial space, commercial sphere, buying and selling. Um, but the internet economy is not just a commercial economy, it's a sharing economy too. And it reminds us of the more anthropological conceptions of economy that say that there are different ways in which people act um, Lewis Hyde's conception of a gift economy is an example of that. Uh, Jochai Benkler's conception of the way in which um, the economy of interaction in, in, in this context is not tied to commercial ventures shows us the opportunity for different economies to hang together. And the most interesting economies, I think, in the context of the internet are these sharing economies and the way they interact with commercial economies. In the political space, I think it's going to be the same story. You know, we've had the 20th century, which has been this history, this century of professionalized politics. Like the whole objective is to tell the amateur politician to shut up and listen to the commercials, right? Just, just sit on your couch and listen to the commercials and we can get the result that we need. But what the internet is doing is reviving a kind of activist, read, write, amateur politician. People who go out and use their social media circles to say what they want about political candidates, to, to revive the freedom that I think was the 19th century freedom about politics, which was this ground up, non-centralized control conception of politics too. Both of them are being fed by this feature, I think it's a feature, not a bug, of the internet that enables this self-organization. Um, um, so I think that complexity of these economies um, is a good thing. But I accept the, the, you know, I accept the suggestion of the initial frame, which is that um, there's, no, there's no necessary magic or goodness that comes out of the mix that the internet produces. Um, for everything good, you can point to something bad. The very same dynamic that produces the opportunity for great produces the opportunity for stuff of the most evil sort. So it's, it's not like you look to this as the savior. I think we just have to look to this as the only opportunity we have to organize against what has become this enormously concentrated power for injustice. So whether it's enough or not is a separate question. It's just that's where it has to happen if it happens anywhere. 